Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. When you hear the word Antarctica, what mental associations do you make? I know that for me, images of vast ice sheets, flocks of penguins and pinniped colonies come to mind, as well as bitterly cold temperatures and many months of winter darkness. However, the continent at the bottom of the world was not always like this. In fact, only developing its familiar, incredibly harsh modern conditions relatively recently. For the majority of its history, Antarctica was quite extensively forested and possessed a temperate climate, with numerous fossil bearing deposits revealing a diverse array of ancient animals and plants, stretching all the way back into the Cambrian. Many of these fossiliferous sites are unfortunately quite obscure and have received relatively little attention, with a lot of information hiding behind academic paywalls, which is a real bugbear of mine. Regardless, from the time of the first tetrapods until the second half of the Miocene, plants remained a notable presence in the fossil record, while terrestrial vertebrates, aside from seabirds and pinnipeds, seem to have vanished around the time of the Eocene Oligocene boundary, circa 36 million years ago, which is probably due to global cooling and the disappearance of large scale Antarctic forests. After this point, the continent's ecosystems changed quite drastically, shifting from cool temperate woodland, comparable to modern day New Zealand or southern Chile, to cold swampy tundra, not unlike parts of Siberia or northern Canada. Recent evidence has indicated that a powerful circumpolar Antarctic current began to form in the Oligocene, basically reaching its modern extent by around 10 million years ago, which led to a significant chilling effect with average Antarctic temperatures falling from about 5 degrees Celsius circa 14 million years ago to minus 2 degrees Celsius by the end of the Miocene. By the Pliocene, ice sheets covered a significant part of the continent, although some species of mosses, lichens, low-growing shrubs, and even small southern beech trees persisted before vanishing at the onset of the Pleistocene. I'll begin this analysis of Green Antarctica in the early Triassic, just after the end Permian mass extinction, when life was just beginning to rebound. The Fremo Formation, located in what is now the Transantarctic Mountains of Southern Antarctica, preserves the earliest known fossil record of tetrapods on the continent, and spans the latest Permian and early Triassic, between 252 and 235 million years ago. The formation possessed a warm temperate climate, composed of riparian forests and floodplains, which were made up of ferns, cycads, horsetails, and the superficially conifer-like tree Dichroidium. None of these plants were cold adapted, although as Antarctica was located at the southern end of the supercontinent Pangaea, winters would still have been very dark for months on end. In fact, given the relatively mild climate of the continent when compared to lands further north, Antarctica seems to have acted as a refuge from the worst of the end Permian extinction event. A variety of animals dwelt here, although the majority of their fossil remains are highly fragmentary. The ecosystems here were clearly quite wet and humid, as indicated by the diverse array of temnospondyl amphibians that were present. Many of these would have resembled large salamanders, and filled ecological niches similar to those of crocodiles, being semi-aquatic ambush predators. Some, such as the genus Cryostega, could reach up to 4.5 metres long, and were among the top order carnivores of the formation. Meanwhile, the small Microfolis was the youngest known member of the family Microfolidae, and the only one native to southern Gondwana, resembling a short-tailed stubby salamander. This animal was fairly closely related to modern Lysamphibians, and represents a pattern of survival wherein amphibians were able to persist in temperate conditions of the south, while their relatives elsewhere died out. The famous Coolasuchus of early Cretaceous Australia is another better known example of this. On land, sauropsid reptiles were quite diverse, with early Archosauromorphs being the largest of these. The most well understood genus was a superficially monitor lizard like carnivore Prolocerta which is also known from early Triassic rocks in South Africa. Measuring about one meter or three feet long, this agile predator possessed serrated teeth, a low pointed snout, and a relatively long neck, useful for hunting insects and small vertebrates. Two larger and more derived archosauriforms were present as well, including the green iguana-sized Antarctanax, and a mysterious, currently unnamed big predator that may have reached about six feet long. In a continuation of the late Permian, 
synaptids were still common and diverse, including the ever-successful dicynodon Lystrosaurus, several relatively large basal cynodonts, and some of the last Theracephalians. Overall, this formation represents an interesting snapshot into a time when the archosauromorphs were rising in terms of size and range of niches, but still being quite uncommon, while some of the old guard Permian synapsids were holding on, having survived the world's worst extinction event. The next well-represented fossil-bearing Antarctic locale requires a significant jump ahead in time to the early Jurassic, when the non-avian dinosaurs were beginning their ascent after yet another serious mass extinction, the Hansen Formation, also located in the Transantarctic Mountains, is dated more to between 194 and 188 million years ago, and is one of only three major dinosaur-bearing rock groups on the continent, with the others being the Lake Cretaceous Santa Marta and Snow Hill Island Formation and its satellites. The Hansen Formation possessed a humid, temperate climate, somewhat similar to that of coastal southern Chile, with forests dominated by gymnosperms, with an understory of ferns and cycads. The region was volcanically active, with evidence of wildfires being relatively common, while areas near the coast probably never dropped below freezing, and could reach 18 degrees Celsius in the bright summer months. Even still, winters were long and harsh, lacking sunlight for almost half the year. Vertebrate fossils from the formation are not exactly well preserved and have been quite poorly explored due to the difficulties of doing paleontological work in modern Antarctica. Several dinosaur genera are known, with the most famous and by far the best preserved being Cryolophosaurus. This theropod was in many ways the Antarctic analogue of the North American Dilophosaurus, being a crested top-order carnivore that measured roughly 7 metres or 23 feet long. A lightly built slender animal, Cryolophosaurus is named after its distinctive pompadour-like head crest, which ran along the width of the skull. This was probably utilised as a means of sexual display, with the crest possibly being covered in a layer of keratin and being brightly coloured. The holotype specimen has been suggested to have been a subadult, meaning that fully grown individuals were larger than Dilophosaurus, reaching an estimated 7.7 .7 or 25 feet long and weighing up to 780 kilograms, or 1,720 pounds. Recent analyses have tended to place Cryolophosaurus as a derived neotheropod quite close to Avirostra, not being as closely related to Dilophosaurus as was once thought. It probably hunted the several genera of sauropodomorphs that lived in the same environment, including two species of browsing massospondylids, one currently being unnamed, and the other being the 6.2 metre or 20 foot long Glacialosaurus. Interestingly, a possible early representative of the true sauropods was found here as well, showing that both basal and more derived sauropodomorphs shared the same ecosystems. Other animals found at the Hansen Formation include a small unnamed Ornithischian, a crow-sized basal pterosaur, and a couple of small theropods, possibly coelophysoids. The next well-studied fossiliferous site in Antarctica was the Snow Hill Island Formation, which is datable to the early Maastrichtian between 71 to 70 million years ago, and overlies the earlier and more sparse Santa Marta Formation. This too was a cool temperate environment, with an average annual temperature of between 10 and 15 degrees Celsius, or 50 to 59 degrees Fahrenheit. The formation would have been coastal, with more inland areas being heavily forested and comprised of conifers, flowering plants such as southern beech trees, as well as ferns and cycads. The surrounding Antarctic seas teemed with life, including ammonites, bivalves and numerous fish, both bony and cartilaginous, with some genera of the latter still around today, including the chimeras and frilled sharks. These were hunted by long-necked elasmosaurids such as Vagosaurus, and the 5 to 8 metre long mosasaur Taniwasaurus, which was also found in New Zealand and probably elsewhere in the southern hemisphere. On land, ecosystems were dominated by non avian dinosaurs, which clearly thrived in these cool conditions. Most are quite fragmentary, including indeterminate titanosaurs, iguanodontians, among some better understood elasmarian ornithopods. The smaller of these was the genus Trinisaura which measured about 1.5 metres or 4.9 feet long, 
being a slender, lightly built bipedal herbivore. Its bones show slower growth rates when compared to ornithopods living further north, suggesting that this was an adaptation for the cooler conditions of Lake Cretaceous Antarctica. The other Elasmerian from the formation, Morosaurus, was significantly larger, reaching up to 5 meters or 16 feet long, being about the size of a donkey, but with a long muscular tail. Like other members of the group, this would have been a fast-running, agile animal, with a higher growth rate than Trinisaura. Elasmerians as a whole seem to have been well adapted for living in the colder climates of southern Gondwana, having also been found in the polar regions of Cretaceous Australia and Patagonia. These herbivores were hunted by the mysterious Paravian theropod Imperobator, which is known from pretty scrappy remains, and has therefore been quite difficult to classify. Measuring an estimated 2 to 3 metres, or up to 10 feet long, this carnivorous genus lacked the distinctive sickle claws of dromaeosaurs, troodontids, and basal avialans, indicating that it was a more basal animal that killed prey by utilising its jaws alone. However, two recent studies have found Imperobator to be a possible unenlagian dromaeosaur, which may mean that it possessed elongated narrow jaws and fed on fish and other small vertebrates. It will take further fossils to clear up this situation and make this classification more certain. Perhaps the most famous dinosaur from this formation was the modesty-sized ankylosaur Antarctopelta, a 4 meter or 13 foot long genus that was a member of the unique southern hemisphere clade Parankylosauria, being a close relative of the Chilean Stegoros and the Australian Cunbarosaurus. Like the former, it probably possessed a distinctive spiked tail tip that would have been utilised either defensively or in disputes with other members of the genus. By the late Maastrichtian, just prior to the KT extinction event, Antarctica was home to a diverse community of seabirds, many of which are quite poorly understood, with only a few having received official scientific names so far. These include the important genus Vergavis, a foot-propelled diver that would have somewhat resembled a modern loon, with a pointed spear-like beak when adapted for grabbing slippery fish. When first described in the early 2000s, it was classified as an early anseriform, the lineage of bird that contains living ducks, geese and screamers. However, later studies questioned this placement, in some cases suggesting that this animal was a more basal ornithurine outside of all living bird groups. The original anseriform placement has very recently been confirmed with the proper description of a skull of Vergavis, indicating that late Cretaceous anseriforms could be pretty different from their modern relatives in terms of beak shape and ecological niche. After the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous, the slate was wiped clean, with the non-avian dinosaurs vanishing and leaving a whole range of ecological niches vacant. Mammals and birds stepped into these roles, with Antarctica being no exception. By the early Eocene, fossil sites in the Antarctic Peninsula display notable similarities with those of Patagonia, carrying forward a pattern also seen in the late Cretaceous. This is typified by the La Maceta Formation, which spans a wide temporal range, from the late Paleocene to the early Oligocene. At this time, the region was dominated by temperate polar forests, consisting of conifers, podocarps and southern beech, being home to a wide variety of mammals of mostly South American origin. These include two genera of early astrapotheres, being modestly sized basal relatives of the more famous and massive trunked forms from later in the Cenozoic. The sheep-sized Trigonostylops lacked a trunk, although may have possessed a fleshy upper lip and already showed enlarged incisors, with both traits being useful for a low-browsing herbivore. Two genera of basal litopterns were also present here as well, filling similar niches to the early perissodactyls on the northern continents. Unlike the more familiar derived litopterns, which tended to resemble camelids and hornless deer, these forms are members of the family Sparnotheriodontidae, which were quite bulky and heavy set animals not built for speed. They may have lived somewhat like living tapirs, with the Antarctic species of the genus Notiolophos being a browsing herbivore comparable in size to a musk ox, reaching 400 kilograms or about 880 pounds. Other terrestrial mammals that foraged on the forest floor include the Gondwanothea sudamerica, which would have been a vaguely guinea pig-like herbivore with high-crowned molar teeth. 
In the trees, a diverse array of arboreal metatherians were present, feeding on insects, fruit, and seeds up in the canopy. These included several relatives of the living Monito del Monte, which inhabits the similar cool temperate forests of modern southern Chile, being the only member of a once diverse family to persist into the Holocene. Some of these animals appear to have made their way across Antarctica, and ended up successfully colonising Australia during the early Eocene, giving rise to all of the living Australian marsupials. The mysterious polydilopimorphs joined them in the trees, although these didn't make the trek to the land down under, and included a disparate array of forms similar to shrew opossums, squirrels, and Australian phalangeriforms. So far, no predatory sporacidonts have been recovered from the Lamaseta formation, with the apex predators here probably being the large forest rachids, although these are only known from a few scraps of bone. Other terrestrial birds were probably found here as well, with the large flightless paleonaths of Australia and Zealandia evolving from ancestors that radiated during the early Cenozoic, once thought to have evolved from flightless Cretaceous Gondwanan ancestors. More recent studies have shown that paleonaths probably developed on the northern continents, with the basal lithornithids being capable flyers. This means that after the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs, these birds migrated into the southern hemisphere via South America, with the ancestors of the emus, cassowaries, moas, kiwis, and the Malagasy elephant birds arriving in their respective homelands via Antarctica. Flightlessness and herbivorous diets then emerged multiple times independently due to a lack of competition in their island habitats. A variety of seabirds flew over the open ocean, including early relatives of albatrosses, as well as the large soaring pseudotooth bird Dasornis, while familiar-looking penguins swam in the seas that surrounded the green Antarctica during the Eocene. Indeed, it's funny to think that penguins have been around long enough to witness the complete transformation of Antarctica from a cool, temperate, forested continent to a frozen wasteland. Yet this hasn't bothered them at all, continuing to thrive there as they have done since the late Paleocene. As noted earlier, terrestrial vertebrate fossils aside from those of seabirds, cetaceans, and later the pinnipeds, vanish at the end of the Eocene about 36 million years ago, probably due to global climatic cooling and the reduction of Antarctica's forests. By the Miocene, ice sheets were beginning to expand across the continent, although large areas of open, cold tundra could still be found until the end of the period, with the last native Antarctic vegetation finally disappearing during the Pliocene by around 4 million years ago, which is still surprisingly recent, with the onset of the Pleistocene glaciations really pushing Antarctica into the deep freeze once and for all. Although, due to recent anthropogenic climate change, the continent is once again seeing the return of green mosses and lichens at its fringes. Thanks for watching everyone. The next episode will be covering the mysterious early evolution of the pterosaurs and their Triassic relatives. See you again soon. Cheerio.